Now when it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a desolate place, and the day is now over. Send the crowds away to go into the villages and buy food for themselves. But Jesus said, They need not go away. You give them something to eat. They said to him, We have only five loaves here and two fish. And he said, Bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass, and taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing. Then he broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the crowds. And they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up twelve baskets full of the broken pieces left over. And then those who ate were about five thousand men besides women and children. The word of the Lord from Matthew 14. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Let's pray. Father, this morning as we... We listen and interact with your word. Each of us here is at a different place on our own spiritual journeys. Some of us have great faith and trust in you. Some of us struggle. Some of us are unsure what we believe right now. Wherever we may be, I ask that you would send your Holy Spirit to come and be present among us, to enlighten our hearts to the truths that are contained within this, these scriptures, and to make our hearts restless, Lord, until we find our rest in you and you alone. All this we ask to your praise and glory. In the precious name of God, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, a few simple questions for everyone here this morning. Have you ever struggled knowing the will of God in a particular situation? Have you ever looked at the pain and the brokenness in this world, and you wanted God to fix it, but you weren't sure how exactly that might fit into His will? Have you ever looked at the pain and the brokenness of those closest to you and you wanted God to fix it, but you were unsure how that would fit into His will? Have you ever looked at the pain and the brokenness in your own life and you desperately wanted God to fix it, but you were unsure how that would fit into His will? What we find in today's scripture is a pretty clear picture of God's will in challenging situations. People are sick, and Jesus heals them. People are hungry, and Jesus feeds them. And I see this story, and my initial reaction is, I want this story to be applied universally to anyone who is in pain or suffering. I want to see them healed. When people I know are hungry, I want them to be fed. When people I know are in pain, I want them to be healed. When I saw my best friend Rob's life, starting to fade away and his health was worsening, I wanted nothing more than for him to be healed and to be better. And yet, as hard as it might be, I had to include in my prayers a very difficult phrase. If it be your will. If it be your will. Our uh, friend, Leonard Cohen, call him our friend, I mean, he feels like a friend because we've been referencing his songs so much the past couple months here. But he wrote a great song that really captures this sentiment and this tension that I think all of us feel one way or another, where we pray for God to do what we know He can do, but recognizing that we may not necessarily get the answers in the way that we want those answers to come about. So with that as an introduction, what I'd like to do is pass things off to our musicians who are going to perform for you their version of this great Leonard Cohen song, If It Be Your Will. And then we're going to see, as we interact with the scriptures, what these scriptures can teach us about the will of God. Mm -hmm. 
Beautiful. Thank you. So for those of you visitors here, um, we have a little tradition where immediately after the message, if you have any questions, we try and interact with those questions and answer it. So you can uh, ask questions any number of ways. My phone number is printed in your bulletin there, so you can shoot me a text message if you want, if you want to kind of stay anonymous, or if you just want to lift up your hand, kind of the old-fashioned way, and ask a question, you're welcome to do that as well. Pretty much anything goes during this time, so really, no, no matter how obscure or weird or odd you might find, the question, please take advantage of this and, and ask. We really want to, to know and, and see if we can get a little discussion going uh, about it immediately after the, uh, the message. So the miracle that we read about in today's story is the only miracle that we find in all four of the Gospel accounts. It's the only miracle we find in all four <coughs> of the Gospel accounts. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John each tell the story about Jesus feeding the 5,000 people. Now there's a little bit of uh, a little bit more detail that's given in some of the other accounts than what we read today, and they each come from a slightly different perspective uh, point of view. But it's definitely the same story told in all four of the Gospels. Now, if you include the women and children who were present in the story, this becomes an even greater miracle because the total number of people who were fed here increases probably to about 15 or 20 thousand people. So imagine this. Supernaturally, Jesus feeds 15 or 20,000 people. And all four Gospels include this story. I think that's important because I think it's a story that God really wants us to interact with. So what is it about this story that's so significant? If nothing else, it really affirms the divinity of Jesus Christ. I mean, no one else but God could take a few pieces of bread and five fish and feed 20,000 hungry souls with it. Who else but God could do this? This is the same God who holds the universe together by the word of his power. He spoke the universe itself into existence. We read about that in the first chapter of Genesis. Verse 14 tells us that before Jesus fed these multitudes, he had compassion on the people, and he went around and he healed the people who were sick. So very clearly, this is a miracle uh, laden couple of ver or several verses that we're interacting with here. In this context, it seems pretty clear that God's will is that these people who were sick be healed and the people who were hungry be fed. But I don't think that's the main application for all of us today. Supernatural healing and, and feeding like we read about in this story doesn't happen all the time. It doesn't seem to be the norm for God's will. Otherwise, this kind of thing would happen all the time the time. And it's not to say that we can't pray for these things to happen and work with whatever resources we have to bring these things about. I think that is something that we can do. But I think the main point to this story is much deeper. I think it gives us a glimpse into the regenerative nature of God. God being in the business of taking fallen, broken things and fixing them, renewing them, regenerating them. And this isn't something that he does in a vacuum. He takes the old stuff the stuff that's already here, and he recreates it. And we find the fullest expression of God's regenerative nature in the future of the cosmos, a new heavens and a new earth, free from sin, free from Satan, free from any kind of oppression or evil. This is a place where there will be no more tears of sorrow and a place where we get to enjoy the beauty of God's creation. In Revelation chapter 21, we read about this. It, takes, it, it describes what it will look like when God takes all the stuff of this earth and recreates it somehow. <clears throat> Here's what the first few parts of that chapter tell us. This is Revelation 21. I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. The sea in this context symbolizes evil and, and darkness. People in that culture were terrified of the sea. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. Here's the great part. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. And here's how God accomplishes it. It says in verse 5, And behold, he who was seated on the throne said, I am making all things new. 
Isn't that a great picture? I love that picture. It sums up what God has been doing throughout history. He has been taking all things in this world, broken and messed up though they might be, and he's been making them new. And in our story today, we get a taste of what that looks like. First, Jesus supernaturally heals people who are sick. He temporarily puts them in the position where they will be with him throughout eternity, completely healed. And then Jesus takes a small portion of food, enough fish and bread to barely feed a little boy for a day, and he recreates it somehow in a manner that the people present could all eat it, but in verse 20 it doesn't say they just ate it. They ate it and were satisfied. He satisfied them through this miraculous event. He didn't just multiply the food, he satisfied all of their needs. So how does that help us as we try and interact with these scriptures and determine God's will for us? How do we, how do we interact with the brokenness that we see in our own lives and the lives of those around us as we look at these scriptures today? Well, look at the disciples in today's story. Look what they do in the face of a very challenging situation. More importantly, look what they don't do. In verse 15, the disciples recognize it's getting late and the crowds need some food. And they're very pragmatic, so they tell Jesus, well, just send everybody away. Get, have them go out into the villages and they can get food for themselves. Now, what they don't do here is acknowledge that Jesus has done some pretty incredible things thus far. And maybe, just maybe, he could do something incredible in this present situation. What they don't do is take a step of faith here and say, Lord, we know that you can do it, so please feed all these people here if it be your will. They don't say that. In John's Gospel, the very first miracle that Jesus does is he changes water into wine. So his disciples should by now already be used to the idea that Jesus can do some pretty interesting food when it comes to food, or interesting things when it comes to food and nourishment, right? Mm -hmm. However, in spite of everything that they've seen Jesus do, they choose to go the practical route. Then in verse 16, Jesus responds to them and he says, they need not go away. You give them something to eat. Now just imagine your disciples hanging out here. I mean, how are you going to react to this? How is God's will going to be accomplished in these circumstances? Lord, we only have five loaves here and two fish. Give me a break, they say in verse 17. I added the give me a break part, but I'm sure they're pretty, pretty frustrated at this point. But what follows is an amazing miracle. Somehow Jesus takes these small amounts of food and he multiplies it into enough food to feed 20,000 people. Now, initially we should respond by looking at this story and saying that even today, if it be God's will to miraculously feed 20,000 people from practically nothing, he will. Somehow, God will find a way, be it through supernatural means, or be it through just moving upon people's hearts and changing their hearts so that they're more generous with what resources they do have, and, and moving them in a direction where they can actually feed those people amongst them who are hungry. He can do, a, do whatever he wants to accomplish in spite of our own doubts, and fears and concerns or lack of resources. Can you identify with the disciples in today's story? Can you identify with a person who's maybe experienced something miraculous in their lives, but at the same time you have doubts about whether or not that can continue, or whether God will ultimately come through for you? In spite of what you know that God can do, all you have is your present situation and you look at it and it seems kind of meager and dire. The resources that you have are limited. How could God possibly use these things or help me in this circumstance? How often do we test God? How often do we bring what resources we have to him and say, well, here's what I have to give. It's not that much. And the situation is pretty hopeless, but let's just see if you can do something. I think there's only one solution to dealing with the tension that we might feel in these difficult times. And that's to use this phrase, if it be your will in our prayers as we bring our resources and our needs to God. For example, I know God has called us to start Incarnation and to continue to build this community that we have, extremely unique as it is and, and, and extremely challenging as it is in so many ways. I know that this is what God has called us to be and to create, and I know that God has called you to be a part of this. But I'll be honest, there are times where it gets stressful and difficult. We don't know 
how our needs are going to be met, and every single time God has come through at the 11th hour. And yet, I have these days where my initial response, when I'm looking at, at what our, our needs are and what our resources are, I can get overwhelmed with panic and worry and distress and fear. Sometimes it just lasts a short time. Sometimes it lasts a little bit longer. But I'm at my best when I remember what God has promised us through the scriptures, when I remember what he's done through the lives of people throughout history, and when I remember what he's done already throughout my own life. And as I pray, when I include these words, if it be your will, in my prayers, I have a certain amount of peace because I know that ultimately God's will will be done and will be accomplished. Now other times I do what the disciples do. I just look at the practical stuff and I say, how is this ever going to be enough to get everything done that we're trying to get done here? And I think all of us probably struggle with that sometimes, whether it's with our money or our relationships or security, whatever the issues are. If we ultimately place our trust in the things of these world to try and, and meet these needs, we're ultimately going to be let down time and time again. So I want to ask a question wherever you may find yourself on your spiritual journeys this morning, and that's this, where do you place your trust? Do you place it in the things of this world and try and figure out how these things can come through for you? Or do you place it in the hands of a God who you know through the scriptures always provides for his people, always takes care of his people, and always meets the needs of those who come to him, though he doesn't always do it in the way they want him to or that they expect him to. But ultimately, he always meets those needs. I know that's a struggle. I know it can be hard to do. That's something that, that, that I've struggled with. It's, it's understandable that we live in this tension where we want God to act the way that we see him acting in today's story, where there are people who are sick, and he heals them. There are people who are hungry, and he feeds them. We want to see that happen exactly how he did it all the time. But that's not the reality. We live in a tension. We're fallen, we're broken, we're limited in our resources. So how do we deal with this tension in our own lives? Well, I think it's through including these words in our prayers, if it be your will. There are so many great lines in that song. We'll just highlight one of them. It's on the cover of the bulletin. It says, if it be your will, if there is a choice, let the rivers fill and let the hills rejoice. Let your mercy spill on all these burning hearts in hell, if it be your will to make us well. I mean, there's, there's an honest confession here that sometimes, sometimes though we might feel like we're burning in hell in this world because of the pain and suffering that we're going through, sometimes it might feel like God isn't answering our prayers to bring healing and to make us well in that context. It's understandable. But we need to include in those prayers, if it be your will, regardless of where we find ourselves on our spiritual journeys. These are important things to reflect upon. If you're a person who's followed Christ for many years, or if you're still trying to figure out what it means to be a follower of Christ, sometimes this life gets really hard, and we get frustrated because we don't see God answering things the way that we want Him to. Well, guess what? No matter how bitter you may become, God will deal with our circumstances and our issues, and His will will be done and accomplished. And I think that adding the words, if it be your will, to our prayers can be humbling and difficult, but at the same time it can bring with it great peace and comfort because we'll be able to see God eventually do above and beyond what we initially expected him to do. Now we know from the parallel accounts of the story today that this, these meager resources that are brought before everyone, the, the loaves and the fishes, were brought by a little boy. A little boy. And we also know that the bread was barley bread, which was like practically not suitable for human consumption. It was the lowest form of bread that people ate in this particular cultural context, which tells us that this boy came from very meager means. So not only was he an insignificant person because he was Jewish in the world in this day and age, but he was, he was from a very meager, uh, low family, a low social status family, and he was a boy. He was just a little boy. Boys didn't have hardly any rights yet. They were basically considered the property of the family until they became men. So here you have one of the most insignificant people in this cultural context bringing almost insignificant gifts to the disciples who then bring these things 
to Jesus, and yet Jesus does something amazing with these things. The lowest of the lows in the society, and yet God uses the lowest of the lows in a way that ultimately is redemptive. Does that sound familiar? Is that a theme that you maybe see throughout the scriptures? Mm. This little boy gives all that he has to Jesus without regard for himself, without regard for how he's going to be able to eat, and God does something amazing. And I think there's a powerful lesson for us here. God is in the business of taking insignificant things and accomplishing his purposes through them in a very real and powerful way. This pattern, again, it's throughout the scriptures. And I think that we can experience this more in our lives if we include this phrase, if it be your will, in our prayers. We can see Jesus performing incredible miracles in our own lives today. Now, we don't have the same power that Jesus had. We can't, we can't multiply bread and make it all of a sudden feed 20,000 people in the way that he does in today's story. <clears throat> but what we can learn from today's story is that God does indeed take small, insignificant things and use small, insignificant people like us in a great and mighty way. As I was reflecting upon this, I thought about the original Superman movie from back in 1978, the one with Christopher Reeve. Mm. It was a great, great movie, and at the end of the movie, I'll spoil it if you haven't seen it, <laughs> Superman has just saved America from the evil schemes of Lex Luthor, who was going to basically take over the, the country and, and cause nuclear explosions to happen and, and a massive earthquake and destroy most of, of America. <laughs> so Superman has now captured Lex Luthor, he takes him to prison, and he drops him off in prison. And the, um, the warden of the prison sees Superman dropping off Lex Luthor, and he's a little bit intimidated. But he stands up and he says to Superman, this country is safe again, Superman, thanks to you. And it's understandable how he'd be a little bit intimidated. I mean, he's just the warden of a prison. You know, he can't fly. He's not invulnerable. He doesn't have heat vision. He can't do all the cool things that Superman can do. But Superman's response to him is very interesting. And I think it's inspiring. He says, no, sir, don't thank me. We're all part of the same team. It's a great line. And then he flies off. And as, he, as Superman flies off, he turns and he looks at the camera and he waves to everyone who's watching the movie. So he's like, when I saw this in the movie theater, I was like, he's waving at me. Now, I'm part of Superman's team. This is great. I don't have superpowers, but he made me feel like I was important and I was significant. What Superman does here, and it's great, he's affirming that everyone can be a, for, a source of, of good in this world. You don't need to have superpowers to do that. And then he passes along the inspiration to the viewing audience, you know, by looking at us and waving <laughs> at us. God can do the same thing. He can use anyone to bring about his will in the world. You don't have to have superpowers. He uses the weak, the powerless, and the insignificant. Today's psalm is talking about taking a step of faith in our prayer and asking for things to possibly be better, believing that things can be better, believing that mercy can be extended, that rejoicing is possible, believing that we can all be made well, and asking to be used by God to bring these things about, if it be your will. Again, this is the story that Scripture tells us over and over again. You see God using the smallest, insignificant things for a greater purpose. And this finds its ultimate fulfillment and a child who was born under scandalous circumstances to a lowly family that didn't have any means at all. Birthed in the lowliest of conditions, surrounded by stinky animals and placed in a feeding trough, Jesus Christ came into this world not as a great king or a ruler, but as a humble servant. And his mission, humanity's redemption, would not be brought about by force, not by political action, but through his own torture and death, death in the most humiliating way imaginable for a Jewish person, death on the cross. And yet, that's how God acted. Because none of us love God like we should, we don't place our trust in Him in the way that we should, we need to place our lives in the Lord's hands and pray these challenging words, if it be your will. But I know that it's hard to do that. We can struggle doing that. And yet, it's possible for us to do it because Jesus Christ has done it for us. In the Garden of Gethsemane, just before he was arrested and tortured and killed, Jesus was praying to God, and he said, Lord, if possible, let this cup pass from me. 
He knew what he was about to go through. And he wanted that to pass from him, if possible, if it was the Lord's will. But he closed his prayer by saying, but not my will, but your will be done, if it be your will. Sometimes God's will doesn't lead to healing, like we saw in today's story, and feeding, like we saw in today's story. Jesus shows us that with his own life and this prayer that he just prayed here in Gethsemane. In his case, his prayer didn't lead to healing. It led to being broken. And it didn't lead to feeding. It led to starvation as he died on the cross. The application for all of us, though, is that he understands our situation. He identifies us in our weakness and our suffering. And sometimes God's will doesn't come about the way that we expect it to. But ultimately, it will serve a redemptive purpose. <clears throat> we just don't always see it initially when we ask him. But I think what we need to do is look through our lot or look at our lives through the lens of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's where we see God's will best revealed for us. That's where we see God using the smallest, most insignificant things and using them for a greater redemptive purpose. And that's where we see strength and weakness and our ultimate redemption accomplished and applied in our lives. Because that was God's will. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Father, as we interact with these, um, these challenging aspects of this, this story, I pray that you would help all of us, no matter where we find ourselves on our spiritual journeys, be able to pray and pray, if it be your will, may these things be done and accomplished. Lord, change us and transform us. Make us more like you and then help us to live our lives in such a way that we can bring honor and glory to you and be vehicles that you would use to accomplish your will here in this world. All this we ask in the name of God, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Have questions here? Any thoughts or, or comments? Yeah, Mike. I was just thinking, you, you know, he couldn't have been, that little boy could not have been the only human being in that mob <laughs> with food because, based on what you just said, yeah. because he was the lowest and, and that amount of food. So he had to have been handpicked by Jesus, or maybe it's because he was right there. You know, it was what they had, and it was right there. Mm -hmm without him making some big announcement to the crowd, you know, it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's like he handpicked that kid and that lowliest of things. Mm -hmm. Well, it could be that that kid was the one that, that was just willing, like, mm -hmm. to offer up what he had mm -hmm. to everyone. I mean, there's a, there's a, a less miraculous view of this story, which I think is just, is equally as miraculous, mm -hmm. and that's that this kid gave up what little he had to try and help meet the needs. Mm -hmm. And then that then inspired other people to do the same thing with what resources they had. And then this large crowd started giving up what resources they had. And then amongst the 20,000 of them, all of a sudden there was enough to be able to feed every single person who was present. Which I would still say, I don't think that's any less of a miracle. I think that's actually a greater miracle. Because yeah. to have 20,000 selfish people who only care about themselves and have just enough food for themselves and their family to all of a sudden sacrificially be willing to give that up to share with other people who don't have as much? I mean, that's a... Yeah, we always picture the fish kind of in Jesus' hand, multiple, like <laughs> yeah. it keeps growing ahead, and the bread keeps getting wider. Yeah. I've never heard it. That's an amazing interpretation of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I think the fact that there were leftovers would mm -hmm. kind of refute that, that thing. If, if you're bringing enough to feed your family, and there's other people that don't have, I mean, if, if you're going out into the wilderness, are you going to take enough to feed yourself for five days? The leftovers is, is mentioned in the feeding of the 3,000, which is the next chapter. It's not mentioned. Yes, it is. I'm thinking here. But there's, there's leftovers? 12, 12 baskets full. Oh, 12 yeah, baskets yeah. full, that's right. Okay. Yeah. Which is a reason to the disciples, too, because there's a basket for each of them who couldn't come up with the food. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, you know, I've known times where we've had potlucks here where we thought we wouldn't have enough food, and then all of a sudden, at the end of the day, we had leftovers. Yeah. Also, because people had done this, or when we've done work for the, the gathering in and we fed the homeless, we ended up having leftovers afterwards, and we didn't think we'd have enough just mm -hmm. because of how much food people 
people brought. So, I mean, I can see how that can happen. Either way, I mean, when, when people have stuff and they think it's enough for their, their family and themselves alone, um, oftentimes they actually do have more than they really need. It's just that our perception of what we need and what we actually need are, are two different mm -hmm. different things. Sure. And I think you could you could see how that could happen. Another thought. I think a lot of us when we pray if you will are actually praying if you can. And the difference is if you can is a questioning of God's ability to meet the need. Mm -hmm. That's not that's not that's not faith. James says if you if you ask not believing, you're not going to receive. If you will is a position of submission. It's the servant saying, Lord, do this if it's your will. If we ask if you can, it's implying God can't. Mm -hmm. I think I think sometimes we we fall short in how we pray because we're begging we're almost begging for healing or for a situation mm -hmm. to be resolved or whatever but we're not like Bob says believe that you have all already received it and it shall be done you know so where does that come in and the way I feel is that if I can walk in the spirit 24 7 I'm guaranteed to be walking in God's will Mm -hmm. So the the events of my life are orchestrated by the divine, and you know it, when Jesus says, like you were talking about meeting your needs, like mm -hmm. does an anxious thought add a day to your life? That's something you know. Seek ye first. I mean, it's all right there, and it's not rocket science. And we still seem to not be able to see that, and we struggle with trying to exert our own will on our situations that have, we have no control over to begin with. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, I'm not saying I do this. I mean, I'm just, that's just. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. when I, one prayer I do is let my eyes be your eyes, my hands be your hands, my will be your will, meaning his will, my thoughts be your thoughts, and my love be your love. That seems to work. Mm. If I use it. <laughs> I mean, well, it's it's a challenge when we're dealing with our own our own suffering because any kind of healing that we experience here is still only a temporary healing. Even the, the raising back to life of Lazarus, Lazarus was a, was a temporary thing. He eventually died, mm -hmm. just like everyone else did. So you have this sort of precursor where whatever physical things were causing him to have died, those were removed, and he's restored to this this healed state. But he eventually did die, but that resurrection of Lazarus was a, a precursor to the future resurrection when when mm -hmm. Lazarus would live in this new heavens and new earth that we read about in Revelation 21, and at that point there would no longer be any death, no more sadness, no more sorrow, no more healing. So even whatever form the healings that we experience in this life take, they're temporary, but they're also a precursor to a greater thing that we're going to experience in, in the future. So I know... I guess I've wrestled with dealing with my, my friend Rob's death. You know, it would have been great if he just popped back to perfect health and was doing great. Um, but you know, when I preached his funeral, I told everyone, I have, I have complete hope that that day will come in the future, and, and he will be you know, playing electric guitar in, in the new heavens and the new earth and just rocking out, and no more arthritis, no more diabetes, none of, those, none of those things anymore. So the physical healing will come. It just doesn't necessarily come in the way that we expect it to or want it to as far as the timing goes, but even if he had experienced physical healing now, he still would have eventually died mm -hmm. and um, <coughs> experienced the future healing you know, that all of us are going to be able to experience as well. And, and so, that's, that's a mouthful, I know, sorry. Okay. Um, but all that to say, I mean, the best way I could deal with Rob and, and asking for God to heal him was just say, if it be your will, mm -hmm. because that healing could manifest in this world right now, but even if it doesn't manifest now, I know that it's his will that it will manifest in the, in the next. And that's, I think, the, the hope that all of us can, can share and can strive for. Amen. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay.